Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. Um, hopefully this is a different topic to the last one that we did and it's something completely new. I got the idea for this uh, having watched the Lotus Eaters book club video about Tom Bingham's rule of law and I became interested in the case of James Somerset which was an important ruling uh, contributing to the uh, abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Uh, like many things in history and observed by Jocko Willink and Daryl Cooper in their podcast Unraveling, uh, the more you pull on a thread uh, the more strands you find. I also liken this to Ayn Rand's epistemological concept of integration, where you first perceive objective reality, uh, the things you see, hear, touch, taste, smell, then you integrate these many data points to form a coherent model of reality uh, without contradictions, and the next step is then to integrate all of these percepts, so the things that you perceive, into concepts, so something that you can then uh, communicate to someone else as you learn to speak. And in researching this case, I started at the moment in history that drew me to the story in the first place, and I then worked backwards to find the historical threads that wove together to form the background of the story. Uh, I found some interesting threads as well that led in other directions, so I've explored some other events around James Somerset's case as well, and I hope that the, in the end it's going to come together a little bit like the end of Snatch here. Do you me? Oh, no, not me. I wouldn't know what to do with this. A knife, for God's sake. What have you used to keep your fork company all these years? A sharp side, a blunt side? Would you want a lesson? Is that Boris? Oh, Tyrone, what have you done? What about Rosebud? Well, you can bring him with you if you like. But which bit would you like to bring? They're getting out. Hold on. Get down and follow them. Cover yourself up, Abby. You're making a scene. I'm sorry for causing a scene, Tony. To give a sense of time, I've woven the many storylines together and discussed all of the events chronologically. And there are a lot of people involved, but I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I initially wanted to give my opinion on the events, but I've changed my view on many of the people several times, uh, trying to work out whether they're good or bad. Obviously, it would be easy to say that all of the slaves and the abolitionists were good people, and all of the slave owners were bad, but I found that actually a lot of the people were more complicated, and it's a lot like uh, Bill Burr said about Arnold Schwarzenegger. That poor bad, huh? Jesus Christ, not a great man. Not a great man brought down by another gold digging whore. No? You don't think so? You don't think that that was a great man? Really? Three decades of awesome movies, bangs one made and now you don't like them? <laughs> Tell you something, that's a great man. Most of what I found suggested that race within this story was actually just used as a quick identifier because there was no formal way of like, determining citizenship of endangered servants in British North America, both black and white. Um, and citizenship was actually denied wherever possible, even to Scottish and Irish immigrants, because they were not English. Uh, after 1661, with the distinction between slaves and indentured servants formalised in uh, the colony of Virginia, uh, there seemed to be a shift in court rulings, for example, to give harsher punishments to escaped black slaves rather than their white co-conspirators. Uh, it could start anywhere, but I'll start with what I think is probably the greatest scene in movie history. Sicilians are great liars best in the world. I'm Sicilian. My father was the world heavyweight champion of Sicilian liars. From growing up with him, I learned the pantomime. There are 17 different things a guy can do when he lies to give himself away. Guy's got 17 pantomimes. Woman's got 20. Guy's got 17. But if you know them like you know your own face, they'd be lie detectors all to hell. Now, what we got here is a little game of show and tell. You don't want to show me nothing, but you tell me everything. I know you know where they are, so tell me. 
before I do some damage you won't walk away from. Could I uh, <clears throat> have one of those Chesterfields now? Sure. You got a match? Oh, wait, no, no, I got don't bother, I don't You're Sicilian, huh? Sicilian. <laughs> you know, I read a lot, especially about things, about history. I find that shit fascinating. Here's a fact. I don't know whether you know or not. Well, Sicilians were spawned by niggas. Come again? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's a fact. Yeah. You see, uh, Sicilians have uh, black blood pumping through their hearts. And, and no, if you, if, you, if you don't believe me, uh, you can look it up. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, you see, uh, the Moors conquered Sicily. And the Moors are niggers. See, you see, way back then, uh, Sicilians were like uh, wives from northern Italy. Uh, they all had blonde hair and blue eyes. But, uh, well... Then the Moors moved in there and, uh, well, they changed the whole country. They did so much with Sicilian women, huh? That they changed the whole bloodline forever. That's why blonde hair and blue eyes became black hair and dark skin. You know, it's absolutely amazing to me to think that to this day, hundreds of years later, that, uh, that Sicilians still carry that gene. Now this, <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm quoting history. It's written. It's a fact that's written. I love this guy. I no, love this guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Your ancestors are niggers. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. And, and your great, 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 great grandmother f***ed a nigger. Oh, yeah. And she had a half nigger kid. Now, if that's a fact, tell me, am I lying? Because you, you're part eggplant. <laughs> no! <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you're a cantaloupe. <laughs> oh! You <laughs> got <laughs> I haven't killed anybody since nineteen eighty four. this comedian's son's apartment come back with something tells me and then the egg all went so I can wipe this egg off my face fix this family for good Hey, boss, get ready to be happy. Now, I wouldn't have worded it quite so strongly as that, but 
The Moors were a large and diverse group from uh, an area called the Megreb, and they also conquered uh, the Iberian Peninsula, which today is Spain and Portugal, along with Sicily and Italy. Uh, the term Moor actually has no ethnological value and was applied to Arabs, North American Berbers and Muslim Europeans alike. In the year 711, Islamic Arabs and Moors of Berber crossed the Strait of Gibraltar into the Iberian Peninsula. By 718, most of Iberia was under Islamic rule, named al Angelus. These Moors continued northeast across the Pyrenees Mountains, only to be defeated by the Franks, led by Charles Martel. In the original caliphate setting on the Iberian Peninsula, the Umayyad Caliphate, there were four main social classes, Muslim Arabs, Muslim non-Arabs, Dhimmis, which were non-Muslim free persons such as Christians and Jews, and slaves. Among Muslims there exists a racial divide in social standing, whereas within non-Muslims, the, uh, the Dhimmis and the, the slaves, uh, there's no racial divide. However, it's likely that the majority of slaves on the Iberian Peninsula in the early years were brought from Africa, and the majority of Christians were white Europeans. The practice of slavery existed in the Muslim al Angelus as well as many Christian kingdoms on the peninsula, and both sides uh, religiously followed the custom of not enslaving people of their own religion. Following the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the Norman French army of William, uh, the Duke of Normandy, defeated the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godwinson, sparking the Norman conquest of England. The Duke of Normandy, now known as William the Conqueror, or William I, commissioned the Doomsday Book, which was effectively the first national census of England. It showed that in 1086, approximately 10% of the 1.71 million inhabitants of England were serfs. Serfs were feudal peasants who paid knights or barons in exchange for being permitted to work the land. The word serf had the same origin as slave. Despite the laws which were introduced in 1080, Gerald of Wales reported that slaves were still being sold in Bristol and North England even a century later. William the Conqueror died in 1087 and was succeeded by his son William II, also known as Rufus, meaning red, owing to his rosy cheeks. Rufus had many conflicts with the church, wanting royal control over both church and state, whilst Anselm, the Bishop of Canterbury, favoured Gregorian Reformation, a universal church with its own authority. Rufus said of Anselm, Yesterday I hated him with great hatred, today I hate him with yet greater hatred, and he can be certain that tomorrow and thereafter I shall hate him continually with ever fiercer and more bitter hatred. Not a great relationship. William Rufus went hunting in the New Forest on the 2nd of August 1100 with some men, which included Walter Tyrrell. Now came William's son, was called Rufus the Red. He took up the crown when his father was dead, and he roamed the hunting grounds in Estet, in the dark of the New Forest, in the dark of the New Forest. But John's classic called out, and Lord Tyrrell fired low, and the arrow struck Rufus with a sickening blow, and he fell from his horse to the ground below, and the land took him for its own, the land took him for its own. So if you steal the land of an English man, then you shall know this curse. Your firstborn son's warm blood will run upon the English earth. That was part of The English Curse by Frank Turner, uh, which is about the blacksmith's curse. To the chroniclers, who were men of the church, uh, this was an act of God and a just end for a wicked king. They regarded it a fitting demise for a ruler who came into conflict with the religious orders to which they belonged. During the reign of William Rufus, the Council of London had been prohibited from convening, and Anselm convened the first major council of his episcopate in 1102. Anselm took the opportunity to initiate Gregorian Reformation, prohibiting marriage, concubinage, and drunkenness to all those in holy orders, condemning sodomy and simony, and also regulating clerical dress. Anselm also obtained a resolution that would prohibit the trade in serfs. Anselm issued a decree. Let no one dare hereafter to engage in the infamous business prevalent in England of selling men like animals. However, the council had no legislative powers and no act of law was valid unless signed by the monarch. Meanwhile, back in the Iberian Peninsula, 
Uh, during 780-year period from when we left off was known as the Reconquista, and it concluded in 1492. Ferdinand II of Aragon, which was Catherine of Aragon's father, and his wife, Queen Isabella of Castile, were known as the Catholic monarchs of Spain, and they laid siege to Granada for eight months following April 1491. A provisional surrender, the Treaty of Granada, was signed on the 25th of November 1491, which granted two months to the city. On the 2nd of January in 1492, the besieging Christians sneaked troops into the Alhambra, which is the main palace, in case resistance materialised, which it did not. A self-educated man, widely read in geography, astronomy and history, formulated a plan to seek a western sea passage to the East Indies, hoping to profit from the lucrative trade of spice. Without the Suez Canal and the Middle East no longer being safe for Christians to travel by land, he believed that travelling west would be a faster route to the East Indies uh, than circumnavigating the Cape of Good Hope. So this man, Christopher Columbus, spent eight years lobbying multiple kingdoms until eventually uh, the Catholic monarchs agreed to sponsor a journey west. On the evening of the 3rd of August 1492, Christopher Columbus departed from Palos de la Frontera in Spain with three ships, La Santa Maria, La Pinta and La Nina, which is shown on the left. Columbus and his crew were the first explorers to encounter the Taino, the Lucayan and also the Arawak people as they landed in the Bahamas on the 12th of October, 1492. The Taino were principal inhabitants of, of most of Cuba, Hispaniola, today the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, and the Northern Lesser Antilles. Columbus wrote of the Taino, Many of the men I have seen have scars on their bodies, and when I made signs to them to find out how this happened, they indicated that people from nearby islands came to San Salvador to capture them. They defend themselves the best they can. I believe that people from the mainland come here to take them as slaves. They ought to make good and skilled servants, for they repeat very quickly whatever we say to them. I think they can very easily be made Christians, for they seem to have no religion. If it pleases our Lord, I will take six of them to your highness when I depart, in order that they may learn our language. Columbus was surprised by the civility of the Taino people. He said, They will give all that they do possess for anything that is given to them, exchanging things even for bits of broken crockery. He noted upon meeting them in the Bahamas in 1492, they were very well built, with very handsome bodies and good faces. They do not carry arms, or know them. They should be good servants. Unlike in Europe, inheritability amongst the Taino followed a matrilineal kinship system, with social status passed through female lines. And, although this is pure speculation by me, but this custom is common outside of Europe, and in English law, the nearest equivalent to this only relates to, to livestock rather than people, uh, which may prove to be an important point in 1662 in another 170 years' time. Native Americans enslaved members of their own and other tribes before and after Europeans arrived, continuing into the 1800s. In three expeditions between 1514 and 1525, Spanish explorers visited the Carolinas and enslaved Native Americans, who they took back to the Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. The Spanish Crown's charter for its 1526 colony in the Carolinas and Georgia required that Native Americans be treated well, paid, and converted to Christianity, but it also allowed already enslaved Native Americans to be brought and exported to the Caribbean if they had been enslaved by other Native Americans. During his first voyage, Columbus came across an unfamiliar plant that was being smoked by the Native people, as described by Bartolomé de las Casas. Men with half-burned woods in their hands and certain herbs to take their smokes, which are some dry herbs put in a certain leaf, also dry, like those the boys make in the day of the Passover of the Holy Ghost, and having lighted one part of it, by the other they suck, absorb, or receive that smoke inside with the breath by which they become unnumbed and almost drunk, and so it is said they do not feel fatigue. These muskets, as we will call them, they call tobaccos. I knew Spaniards on the islands of Espanola who were accustomed to take it, and being reprimanded for it by telling them it was a vice, they replied they were unable to cease using it. I do not know what relish or benefit they found in it. Again, the boy refused to cry out. A 
knout is a heavy, scourge-like multiple whip, usually made with a series of rawhide thongs attached to a long handle. It was a Tartar invention, introduced to Russia in the 15th century. Flagellation with a knout was a form of corporal punishment in Russia for criminals and serfs. Twenty blows with a variation called a great knout could kill a person, and capital punishment was sentences of hundreds of lashes, with death being attributed to breaking of the spine. In England, in 1569, a man named Cartwright was savagely observed beating another, which in law would have amounted to battery. Cartwright's defence for this was that the man was a slave whom, whom he had brought to England from Russia, and thus believed this treatment was lawful. Whipping was painful and shameful, flagellation for slaves. In the 11th of Elizabeth, one Cartwright brought a slave from Russia and would scourge him for which he was questioned, and it was resolved that England was too pure an air for slaves to breathe in, and indeed it was often resolved, even in Star Chamber, that no gentleman was to be whipped for any offence whatsoever, and his whipping was too severe. The original documents have not been found, and it has been suggested that Lord Hardwick's original comment was that as soon as a man sets foot on English ground, he is free. John Rolfe was born in 1585 near Norfolk in England. By this time, the Spanish Empire held a virtual monopoly on the trade of tobacco. Most Spanish colonies in the New World were located in more southerly climates that favoured tobacco growth, whilst the English settlements were more northerly. Rolfe saw the opportunity that the colony of Virginia, established in 1607, presented to grow tobacco and undercut Spanish imports. A particularly popular strain of tobacco was grown in Trinidad, and Spain had declared a death penalty to anyone selling the seeds to a non-Spaniard. Somehow, John Rolfe obtained some of these seeds. The colony of Virginia was reliant upon trade with the Native Americans and supplies from England for its survival. Other than John Smith being 27 and Pocahontas being 9, that they probably only met in passing and that he never let the truth get in the way of a good story, this seems to be uh, an accurate metaphor for the relationship with the Native Americans in 1607. The third supply to Virginia set sail from England on the 2nd of June 1609, destined for Bermuda, and then with two of the nine ships to continue their voyage to Jamestown, Virginia. The fleet was headed by a new flagship of the Virginia Company, the Sea Venture, of which John Rolfe, his wife Sarah Hacker, and the majority of the provisions for Jamestown were aboard. The fleet was hit by a tempest and became separated. Four of the ships were able to regroup and headed to Jamestown, and the three remaining ships arrived later. One ship, the Catch, was lost at sea, and Sea Venture was wrecked in Bermuda. On the third day inside the Tempest, the new corking was forced from between the timbers, and the ship began to leak rapidly. All hands were applied to bailing, but the water continued to rise. The captain deliberately steered the ship onto the reefs of Discovery Bay to prevent it from sinking, and this allowed 150 people and a dog to be landed safely ashore. The survivors were stranded in Bermuda for approximately nine months, and Sea Venture's wreck is thought to have been William Shakespeare's inspiration for his play, The Tempest. Between August and October 1609, the seven surviving ships arrived safely in Jamestown, but brought with them outbreaks of yellow fever and London plague. At the beginning of winter, Jamestown had a population of about 500 residents. However, without the provisions from Sea Venture, and with the introduction of diseases, there were only 61 people left alive when spring arrived. During the nine-month period following the wreckage of Sea Venture, the survivors constructed two new ships from the wreckage, combined with local Bermuda Cedar. 
While these new ships were being built, C. Venture's longboat was fitted with a mast and sent to Virginia, but the boat and its crew were never seen again. Finally, the two ships, aptly named Deliverance and Patience, along with 142 survivors, set sail for Virginia on the 11th of May 1610, over 11 months after they had originally left England. The colony of Bermuda dates its settlement from 1609, and among those left buried in Bermuda were John Rolfe's wife, Sarah Hacker, and their infant daughter, Bermuda Rolfe. Endangered servitude in continental North America began in the colony of Virginia in 1609. Lands acquired from Powhatan Indians by white settlers required large amounts of tedious labour in order to, tr to transform the colony into a profit-producing venture. The most critical economic problem facing early investors in the Virginia Company and the settlers they sent to North America was recruiting and motivating an adequate labour force. Initial efforts to build a labour force yielded disappointing returns. The cost of passage to Virginia in the early 17th century was high compared to annual wages, and few prospective migrants were able to pay the cost of their voyage out of their own savings. To resolve this issue, the Virginia Company decided to use its own funds to advance the cost of passage to prospective settlers. The company's advance took the form of loan to migrants who were contracted to repay the debt out of their net earnings in America. The company went on to design three different forms of servitude contracts. The premises for the contract we're going to focus on is one of indenture, where the colonist pays for immigrants to travel to Virginia in exchange for land, and the immigrants engage in a contract of indenture where they work the land for a set period as repayment for their passage being funded. Just to go on a slight tangent. As an economic model, paying with labour is a terrible system because the employer may not be offering jobs within the endangered servant skill set and therefore reducing the product of their labour. Furthermore, by tying payment to time rather than output provides no incentive to increase efficiency of output. In his book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Yuval Noah Harari wrote, In the Middle Ages, sugar was a rare luxury in Europe. It was imported from the Middle East at prohibitive prices and used sparingly. After large sugar plantations were established in America, ever-increasing amounts of sugar began to reach Europe. The price of sugar dropped, and Europe developed an insatiable sweet tooth. However, growing cane and extracting its sugar was a labour-intensive business. Few people wanted to work long hours in malaria-infested sugar fields under a tropical sun. Contract labourers would have produced a commodity too expensive for mass consumption. To which I'd like to reply. Followed by this chart, the price of sugar from 1784 to 2017. Just look at those sugar prices from the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 until 1971 when nominal pricing became obsolete. Now, if I were an advocate for slavery, I would want to show how efficient slavery was compared to the free market, but I don't want to do this because, to be honest, I'm not Harari. Thankfully, such issues could be avoided today by applying for a loan and making repayments from future income rather than paying directly with labour. In England, in 1610, the Lord High Treasurer, Robert Cecil, submitted plans known as the Great Contract to James I of England and VI of Scotland, and also to Parliament. It sought to provide an annual income to the Crown in exchange for its feudal rights. After some deliberation, the King withdrew from this because he did not want to lose the means of controlling his more powerful subjects through his feudal rights, and Parliament withdrew because they did not want to allow the King financial independence from his continual income of £200,000 per year. Back to Virginia, following the starving time, abandonment of the new colony of Jamestown was narrowly avoided following the arrival of the Sea Venture survivors, and the Fourth Supply, which was led by Thomas West, who had intercepted the abandoning colonists and promptly started a war with the Powhatans. After settling in, John Rolfe began his long-delayed work, and in 1611 he was the first to commercially cultivate Nicotiana tobaccum in North America, and the exports in 1612 turned the colony of Virginia into a profitable venture. On the 5th of April, 1614, Rolfe married the daughter of the Powhatan chief, Wahum Seneca, named Matoke, or Pocahontas, meaning naughty little brat. Their marriage created a climate of peace between the Jamestown colonists and the Powhatan tribes for many years. Pocahontas, who was now baptised Rebecca, became gravely ill when she was returning from London in 1617, and her grave now lies beneath the chancel at St George's Church in Gravesend. Chief Wahun Seneca died in 1618 and was succeeded by his brother, Opta Chapman, and then by their youngest brother, Opechancanough, in 1620 or 1621.
The first recorded Africans arrived in Virginia in late August 1619 aboard White Lion, one of the privateer ships sponsored by Robert Rich, which flew under the Dutch flag. The 20 or so African captives were seized by the British crew from a Portuguese slave ship, São João Bautista, and it, they're thought to have originated from Portuguese Angola. The Jamestown colony exchanged provisions for the ship with endangered servitude of the Africans. Africans were considered the best answer to the labour shortage in the New World because Native American slaves were more familiar with the environment and would often successfully escape into the wilderness. However, Africans had much more difficulty surviving in an unfamiliar environment and were less likely to try to escape. European diseases such as smallpox and African diseases such as malaria and yellow fever drastically reduced the number of local Native Americans. Europeans were also very susceptible to malaria and yellow fever, and the supply of European endangered servants was limited. African slaves became the dominant source of plantation workers because they were more resistant to malaria and yellow fever, and because they were unfamiliar to the environment. Resistance to malaria is often attributed to inheriting conditions that cause abnormal haemoglobin, or red blood cells. The distribution of sickle cell is shown here as HBS, which is in orange. This is a picture of what a normal haemoglobin looks like compared to sickle cell haemoglobin. Sickle cell is a trait that has other side effects as well, where normal haemoglobin can become sickle shaped during anaerobic exercise or dehydration, and sickle shaped blood cells can't pass easily through smaller blood vessels and capillaries. This can lead to cramping, breakdown of muscle cells and cardiovascular disorders. In 1621, a black Angolan named Antonio worked on a tobacco plantation as an endangered servant for a merchant named Bennett at the Virginia Company. This was possibly Edward Bennett, uncle to the future governor of the colony of Virginia, Richard Bennett, here shown on the left. An advisor to Chief Opechanano was murdered by a settler in the spring of 1622, leading to a campaign of surprise attacks by the Powhatans. The Indian massacre of 1622 resulted in a total of 347 men, women and children killed, which at the time was a quarter of the population of the colony of Virginia. On Bennett's plantation, 52 people were killed and Antonio was among the 57 survivors. In 1623, a black woman named Mary was brought to work on Bennett's plantation and was the only woman. Antonio and Mary married and lived together for over 40 years, working the end of their indenture in 1635. Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and entered the legal record as a free man when he purchased a calf in 1647. On Tuesday the 30th of January 1649, Charles I, King of England, Scotland and Ireland, was executed by beheading and the Commonwealth of England was governed as a republic. In 1651, Johnson was granted a large plot of farmland by the colonial government after he paid off his indenture contract by his labour. To promote settlement of the New World, head rights were granted to anyone who would pay for the transportation costs of an indentured labourer. Once the indentured servants completed their indenture, they too were granted 50 acres of land. On the 24th of July 1651, Johnson acquired 250 acres of land under the head rights system by buying the contracts of five indentured servants, including his son Richard. In 1652, a fire caused great losses for the family, and Johnson applied to the courts for tax relief. At the time, taxes were levied on people, not on property, and under the 1645 Virginia Taxation Act, all Negro men and women and all other men from the age of 16 to 60 shall be judged tithable. On the 28th of February 1652, the court reduced the family's taxes and exempted Mary and their two daughters from paying taxes at all during their natural lives, giving them the same treatment as English women who were not taxed. By 1649, there were still only around 300 people of African origin in, in the, origin in the Virginia colony, making up around 1% of the population. Johnson had the services of five endangered servants, four white and one black man named John Kaser, whose contract to Johnson is alleged to have been bought in the early 1640s. In 1653, Kaser approached Captain Samuel Goldsmith, claiming that he was being held illegally and his indenture had expired seven years earlier, and he'd been told by Johnson that he didn't have one. Both Kaser and Johnson were illiterate, and so it may be that neither of them could actually know whether he was speaking the truth. A neighbour, Robert Parker, and two of Johnson's white indentured servants claimed to have knowledge of Kaser's indenture and said that Johnson feared losing his head rights land if the case went to court. Parker, along with Mary Johnson and her two sons, persuaded Anthony Johnson to set Kaser free, whereupon Kaser 
went to work for the neighbour, Robert Parker. A few months later, in 1654, Anthony Johnson brought suit in the Northampton County Court against Robert Parker for detaining his servant, John Kayser. On the 8th of March, 1655, the court ruled in favour of Johnson and ordered that John Kayser return to the service of Anthony Johnson and that Robert Parker make payment of all charges in the suit. Kayser remained Johnson's indentured servant for the rest of his life. Although there were both black and white indentured servants who had been sentenced to lifetime servitude before Kayser, this was the first instance of a judicial determination in the 13 colonies holding that a person who had committed no crime could be held in servitude for the duration of their life. Colonel Edmund Scarborough was an influential early settler of Virginia and a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, the legislative body. In 1657, Scarborough forged a letter in which Anthony Johnson acknowledged a debt. Despite being illiterate and unable to have written the letter, Johnson did not contest the case in court and Scarborough was awarded 100 acres of Johnson's land. With the Stuart Restoration in 1660, the Convention Parliament passed an act for taking away the courts of, of wards and liveries and tenures in capites, and by knight service and purveyance, and for settling a revenue upon his majesty in lieu thereof, which is now called the Tenures Abolition Act 1660. The act replaced various types of military and religious services that tenants owed to the crown with so charge, a regular fee paid in exchange for working the land. The monarch would instead be compensated an annual payment of £100,000, which is half of the amount proposed in 1610, raised by a tax on alcohol. This was the end of the feudal system in England. As I previously mentioned in 1492, English common law was paternalistic or patriarchal and held that among English subjects, a child's status was inherited from their father. However, officials didn't know how to treat children in the colony born to parents where one was not English. Beginning in 1662, the colonial legislature incorporated that civil doctrine of partus sequitur ventrum. Literally, that which is brought forth follows the belly, to establish that all children born in this country shall be held bond or free according to the legal condition of the mother, because enslaved African women and their children were not British subjects. Therefore, children of enslaved mothers were born into slavery as chattel, chattel being property or large livestock, regardless of the status of their father. This is entirely speculation by me, but the matrilineal kinship system common among the indigenous populations may have made it easier to implement this system in the colonies than it would have been in Britain, particularly if this was already the custom of the slaves. In 1670, Anthony Johnson died, and a judge ruled that he was not a citizen of the colony on account of him being a Negro, and his plantation was given to a white colonist. Despite Anthony and Mary's children and grandchildren owning land, the Johnson family had vanished from historical records by 1730. Lord Chief Justice John Holt is frequently credited with playing a major role in ending the persecution of witches in English law, but he was also causing ripples for slave traders in England. In Butts v Penny in 1677, the Court of the King's Bench held that an action for damages resulting from lost property could be brought against runaway slaves as if they were chattel. But this was reasoned on the grounds that they were infidels rather than slaves and lacked the rights enjoyed by Christians. John Holt rejected this reasoning in 1697 in Chamberlain v Harvey, where he denied the possibility of bringing a contract for the sale of a black person in England on the grounds that, as soon as a Negro comes to England, he is free. One may be a villain in England, but not a slave. A villain was a status as a feudal serf, which had largely died out by 1500. In 1607, Holt refused an action for Trover in relation to a slave, holding that no man could have property in another, but held that an alternative action, trespass, qua captivum sum sepit, would be available, which was actually felt to have strengthened the legal position of the slave owners in the case. Following Holt's spree of challenging rulings, slave merchants sought a legal opinion relating to the legality of slavery under English law in 1729. Sir Philip York, then the Attorney General, and Charles Tabbert, then the Solicitor General, opined that under English law, a slave's status did not change when he came to England, a slave could be compelled to return to the colonies from England and that baptism would not manumit, free, a slave. They summarised the following. We are of opinion that a slave coming from the West Indies to Great Britain or Ireland, with or without his master, doth not become free, and that his master's property or right in him is not thereby determined or varied, and that baptism doth not bestow freedom upon him or make any alteration in his temporal condition in these kingdoms. We are also of opinion that his master may legally compel him to return again to the plantations. 
The opinion cited no authorities and set out no legal rationale for the views expressed in it, but it was widely published and relied on. The opinion was largely accepted in England as a definitive statement of the law for nearly 40 years. Curiously, the opinion made no reference to either the abolition of the trade of serfs in 1102 by the Council of Westminster, or to the decision in Cartwright's case from 1569, a case often cited as authority for the statement that England has too pure an air for a slave to breathe in, nor did it refer to the two decisions of Lord Holt which led to the controversy. We come to the year 1725, and Charles Stuart was born in the Orkney Isles off the coast of Scotland. He emigrated to Virginia in 1741, where he became a successful merchant and receiver general for the Eastern Middle District of British North America. In the same year, 1741, James Somerset was born enslaved in Africa. He was brought across the Atlantic Ocean, and sometime in the spring of 1749, Somerset arrived in the Boston province of Massachusetts Bay, which was a British Crown colony. In August 1749, Charles Stuart purchased James Somerset, who learned English very quickly. Scattered records suggest that Stuart had some affection for Somerset, treating him kindly, even generously, and as a trusted servant and valet. Stuart dressed Somerset in more expensive clothes than his other slaves, and travelled with him to important business meetings. In 1745, a Scottish nobleman by the name of Sir John Wedderburn, the fifth baronet of Blackness, was captured by the English at the Battle of Culloden, after serving as a colonel in the Jacobite army. His 16-year-old son, also John Wedderburn, made his way to London to plea for his father's pardon, but his mission failed and he witnessed his father's execution as a traitor by hanging, drawing and quartering. John Wedderburn was forced to return to Scotland where he found himself cut off from his inheritance and decided to seek prospects in the New World with his brother James. In 1747, the Wedderburn brothers landed in the British colony of Jamaica. They tried their hands at numerous different occupations, even practicing as medical doctors for a few years despite having no qualifications. Eventually, they managed to acquire enough capital to become planters, with John becoming the largest landowner in Jamaica with 17,000 acres of land, 10% of the island's landmass. In 1750 in Algiers, an Irish merchant named Edward Shanley brought an eight-year-old black boy slave for his niece, Margaret Hamilton. Two years later, Margaret baptised the boy as a Christian and named him Joseph Harvey. At the age of 20, in 1757, our Royal Navy officer, Sir John Lindsay, was made a captain of a 28-gun frigate HMS Trent which was among the ships used to capture Spanish ships in the Caribbean. During this period, Lindsay found an imprisoned slave named Maria Bell aboard a Spanish ship, who he took as his prisoner and brought to England in 1761, where she gave birth to Lindsay's illegitimate mixed-race mulatto daughter, uh, Dido Elizabeth Bell. In England, in early 1759, Margaret Hamilton succumbed to a serious illness. On her deathbed, she informally released Joseph Harvey from slavery. As he recalled four years later, she said, Here, take this. There is £700 or £800 in banknotes and some more in money, but I cannot directly tell you what, but it is all for you, to make you happy. Make haste, put it in your pocket, tell nobody, and pay the butcher's bill. Now, <laughs> I'm not a judge, but if someone reported this to me four years after the event, I'd be pretty suspicious. Um, just so you know, what. When Margaret said the butcher's bill, uh, it may be slang for paying the physician following the treatment of her, of her illness. Uh, as Historic England says, uh, the passage is striking for simultaneously containing both the master's gift of freedom and a menial errand. To give context to the size of this lump sum, £800 would have been £162,000 or $225,000 in 2020. Margaret's estate was estimated to be valued at £3,000, which may have included Harvey, and it was being administered by her uncle, Edward Shanley. In 1762, during the Seven Years' War, a ship carrying Spanish prisoners of war ran aground near Norfolk in Virginia. An angry mob set upon the Spaniards, killing two of them, and Stuart intervened and saved the lives of the rest, and his actions impressed the authorities so much that he was rewarded with a position in the Customs Office, where he eventually rose to the post of Paymaster General for the American Customs Board. In the same year, in 1762, John Wedderburn attended an auction and purchased a boy aged 12 or 13 years named Joseph Knight, who had been brought to Jamaica from Guinea. Wedderburn employed him as a domestic servant, teaching him to read and write. James Wedderburn, John's brother, had children with many of his slaves, and in 1762, a slave named Rosanna gave birth to Robert Wedderburn, who eventually became an ultra-radical leader and anti-slavery advocate in London. 
His father, James Wedderburn, registered Robert and his older brother as being born free, and then sold Rosanna, their mother, at the time five months pregnant with his third child, back to her previous owner. In England in 1763, Edward Shanley sued Joseph Harvey in a court of chancery to recover the money that his late niece had allegedly given to him and sought a determination of the effects of the estate, potentially including Harvey. The action was dismissed by Robert Henley, the Lord Chancellor, with costs against Shanley. In his judgment, Henley said, As soon as a man sets foot on English ground, he is free. A negro may maintain an action against his master for ill usage and may have a habeas corpus, which is a case for unlawful imprisonment, if restrained of his liberty. However, these comments were considered over dicta, meaning by the way, rather than ratio decidente, the rationale for the decision, and so they were not binding. Meanwhile, John Lindsay continued his duties in the Caribbean. Lindsay returned to England in 1765 and entrusted his daughter Dido to his uncle William Murray, first Earl of Mansfield and Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench. In keeping with colonial law, Dido was born into slavery, but Lord Mansfield and his wife Elizabeth Murray, Countess of Mansfield, raised her as a free gentlewoman, educating her, and according to Mansfield, Belle was treated like the rest of the family when she was in company with only the family. Dido was baptised at St George's in Bloomsbury in the London borough of Camden in 1766. In the same year, Belle was joined in the custodianship of Lord and Countess Mansfield by her second cousin, Lady Elizabeth Murray, following the death of her mother. Elizabeth Murray was one year older than Dido when the pair was subject to this notable painting attributed to David Martin. In 1769, Charles Stuart travelled from the British colony of Jamaica to London to help support his sister Cecilia and her family following the death of his brother-in-law. He brought James Somerset with him to Britain as a servant and a valet. There is no indication that Stuart mistreated Somerset or physically abused him. Also in 1769, John Bedderburn returned to Scotland where he sought to re-establish his family's respectability, marry and raise a family, and also reclaim the title of Baronet of Blackness. He brought Joseph Knight with him to Scotland, where Knight was baptised and married Anne Thompson, a servant of the Wedderburn family, with whom he had at least one child. On the 12th of February in 1771, Somerset was baptised as a Christian at the Church of St Andrew in Holborn, in London. This was witnessed by his three abolitionist godparents, John Marlowe, Thomas Walkin, and Elizabeth Cade. Following contact with a number of free blacks and white abolitionists in Britain, Somerset had become motivated to secure his freedom and ran away from Stuart's home in October 1771. Stuart was angered by this and put up notices about his loss. Somerset was recaptured on the 26th of November and Stuart decided that Somerset be sold for labour on a plantation in Jamaica. It should be noted that this would have been a significant change for Somerset, who seems to have lived quite a comfortable life with Charles Stuart. The average lifespan of an enslaved person in Jamaica was less than 20 years. The conditions for slaves in the West Indies were so severe that there were a shortage of slaves in North America, resulting from the high turnover of slaves in the Caribbean. In 1739, Charles Leslie wrote of Jamaica that no country excels in a barbarous treatment of slaves or in cruel methods they put them to death. By 1770, Jamaica had five towns populated by escaped slaves and their descendants known as Maroons, which were now headed by white superintendents who reported to a superintendent in general named William Ross. Somerset was found jailed on board the ship Anne and Mary, arrived in Thames from Virginia and bound for Jamaica, captained by Captain John Knowles. The return stated that Somerset was a slave under the law of Virginia. Around this same time, Dido Elizabeth Bell encountered the poet and moralist James Beattie, who commented on Dido's intelligence and his elements of moral science. I happened, a few days after, to see his theory that black people had lower mental capacity than white people, overturned, and my conjecture established by a Negro girl about ten years old who had been six years in England, and not only spoke with the articulation and accent of a native, but repeated some pieces of poetry with a degree of elegance which would have been admired by any English child of her years. At this age, Dido is also mentioned in the personal diary of Thomas Hutchinson, then governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay. Bell was called upon by my lord every minute for this thing and that, and showed the greatest attention to everything he said. He also talked about his first impressions of her at Lord Mansfield House, saying, A black came in after dinner and sat with the ladies, and after coffee 
walked with the company in the gardens. One of the youngest ladies, having her arm within the other, she had a very high cap, and her will was much frizzled on her neck, but not enough to answer the large girls now in fashion. I knew her history before, but, but my lord mentioned it again. Sir Lindsay, having taken her mother prisoner in a Spanish vessel, brought her to England, where she delivered of this girl, of which she was then with child, and which was taken care of by Lord M, and has been educated by his family. He calls her Dido, which I suppose is all the name she has. He knows he has been reproached for showing fondness for her, I dare say, not criminal. On the 3rd of December in 1771, Somerset's three godparents made an application before the court of the King's Bench for a writ of habeas corpus. The Chief Justice of the King's Bench, Lord Mansfeld, set Somerset free on recognizance for a hearing he had ordered for the 21st of January 1772. Somerset's cause was taken up by a layman and leading abolitionist named Granville Sharp. Sharp continually sought test cases against legal justifications for slavery and saw this as a cause célèbre. The case has attracted a great deal of attention in the press and members of the public donated money to support the lawyers for both sides of the argument, depending on their own allegiances. Somerset had five advocates, and they were Francis Hargrave, James Mansfield, Sergeant-at-Law William Bull Davy, Sergeant-at-Law John Glynn, John Alling, and John Philpot Curran. Somerset's counsel granted a request to prepare arguments, and so the case was adjourned until the 7th of February 1772. Somerset's advocates argued that while colonial laws might permit slavery, neither the common law of England nor any statutory law made by Parliament recognised the existence of slavery. They also argued that English contract law did not allow a person to enslave themselves because contract law cannot be binding without a person's consent. Stuart's lawyers argued that property was paramount and that it would be dangerous to free all black people in England, who numbered approximately 15,000 of the 6.62 million population. On the 14th of May 1772, Lord Mansfield stated, Mr. Stuart advances no claim on contract. He rests the whole demand on the right to the Negro as a slave and mentions the purpose of detainure to be the sending of him over to be sold in Jamaica. If the parties will have judgment, fiat justitia, ruat coelem, let justice be done, whatever the consequences. Fifty pounds a head may not be a high price, then a loss follows the proprietors of above seven hundred thousand pounds sterling. How would the law stand with respect to their settlement, their wages? How many actions for any slight coercion by the master? We cannot in any of these points direct the law. The law must rule us. In these particulars, it may be a matter of weighty consideration what provisions are made or set by law. Mr. Stewart may end the question by discharging or giving freedom to the Negro. Lord Mansfield encouraged the parties to come to a settlement and tried to persuade Stewart to let Somerset go. Otherwise, he said that a judgment would be given and the consequences may be serious and challenge the legality of slavery. Lord Mansfield was anxious to avoid the issue principle. Stuart refused, and his case was financed by the planters of the West Indies, who wanted to force a ruling that they believed would confirm that slavery was legal. Although Lord Mansfield had indicated to them that he was likely to rule against them, they refused to back down. As a last resort, Mansfield tried to persuade Somerset's godmother, Elizabeth Cade, to buy him from Stuart to set him free, but she declined on principle. <laughs> now, when I read this, it really irked me, because... James Somerset seemed to have quite a comfortable life, and it reads as if, and this is my own conjecture, that his godparents almost coaxed him into escaping, just so that they had a legal case and that they could uh, further their political aims. And as a result of this, he was now facing the possible deportation to Jamaica, and they were doing nothing to try and help him, putting their own political ambitions ahead of his own well-being. The winner is unsuccessful. The first runner-up will take his place. And so on and so forth. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Let the tournament begin! The transcription by the General Evening Post of the judgment given on the 22nd of July, 1772, read, We paid you attention to the opinion of Sir Philip York, and Mr. Talbot in the year of 1729, by which they pledged themselves to the British planters for the legal consequences of bringing slaves into the or their being baptised, which opinion was repeated and recognised by Lord Hardwick, sitting as Chancellor on the 19th of October 1749, to the following effect, he said that Trover, a lawsuit for the recovery of damages for wrongful taking of property, would lay for a Negro slave, 
that a notion prevailed that if a slave came into England or became a Christian, he hereby became emancipated, but there was no foundation in law for such a notion. That when he and Lord Talbot were attorney and solicitor general, this notion of a slave becoming free by being baptised prevailed so strongly that the planters industriously prevented their becoming Christians, upon which their opinion was taken, and upon their best consideration they were both clearly of opinion that a slave did not in the least alter his situation or state towards his master or owner, either by being christened or coming to England. So what he, what he said by this is that the York Talbot slavery opinion sought by the slave merchants in 1729 was correct, and merely being on English soil or being christened does not change the contract of a slave. That though the statute of Charles II had abolished tenure so far that no man could be a villain regarding, yet if he would acknowledge himself a villain engrossed in any court of record, he knew of no way by which he could be entitled to his freedom without the consent of his master. So, by this he meant the the Tenure's Abolition Act of 1660 meant that no man could be a feudal serf, but if he identified himself as one, then he could only be freed by his master. We feel the force of the inconveniences and consequences that would follow the decision of this question. Yet all of us are so clearly of the opinion upon the only question before us, that we think we ought to give judgment, without adjourning the matter to be argued before all judges, as usual in habeas corpus, and as we at first intimated an intention of doing in this case. The only question then is, is the cause returned sufficient for remanding him? If not, he must be discharged. So, so by this what he meant is that this is a case for unlawful imprisonment and not a case over the legality of slavery. Therefore, the only question is whether James Somerset was legally or illegally detained. And if James Somerset was not legally detained, then he must go free. The cause returned is the slave absented himself and departed from his master's service and refused to return to serve him during his stay in England whereupon his master's orders he was put on board the ship by force and there detained in secure custody to be carried out of the kingdom and sold so high an act of dominion must derive its authority if any such it has from the law of the kingdom where executed a foreigner cannot be imprisoned here on the authority of any law existing in his own country the power of a master over his servant is different in all countries more or less limited or extensive the exercise of it therefore must always be regulated by the laws of the place where exercised so, so what he meant here was that although James Somerset left his master's service, if he was detained in England, it should be done in accordance with English law, not the laws of any other jurisdiction, including Virginia. The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of now being introduced to the courts of justice upon mere reasoning or inferences from any principles, natural or political. It must take its rise from positive law. The origin of it can in no country or age be traced back to any other source. Memorial usage preserves the memory of the positive law long after all traces of the occasion, reason, authority, and time of its introduction are lost, and in a case so odious as the condition of slaves must be taken strictly. This is pretty much a passage of Obedicta showing Lord Mansfield's negative view of slavery. He does not believe that slavery is justified within natural law, and that if any positive law had been passed to legalise slavery, it would only have been allowed to continue in its current form if everyone had forgotten the reason for passing the law in the first place, and no positive law had ever actually been passed in England. The power claimed by this return was never in use here. No master ever was allowed here to take a slave by force to be sold abroad because he had deserted from his service, or for any other reason whatever. We cannot say the cause set forth by this return is allowed or approved by the courts of the kingdom, therefore the black must be discharged. And what he meant here is that no law exists to permit slaves to be removed from the country by force, and so James Somerset was not detained in accordance with the laws of England. Therefore, James Somerset must be allowed to walk free. Lord Mansfield's disparaging remarks on slavery resulted in many wrongfully believing that slavery had been outlawed in England, and this resulted in between ten and 15,000 slaves being set free. Joseph Knight sought permission from John Wedderburn to live with his wife and family, or Wedderburn refusing... Knight left his service, whereupon Wedderburn had him arrested. In 1774, inspired by the Somerset case, Knight brought a claim before the justices of the Peace Court in Perth, which found in Knight's favour. The means by which those who carried this child from his own country got him into their hands cannot be known, because the law of Jamaica makes no inquiry into that circumstance. But whether he was ensnared or brought from his parents, the iniquity is the same. 
that a state of slavery has been admitted in many nations does not render it less unjust. Tyranny and all sorts of oppression might be vindicated on the same grounds. Neither can the advantages procured to this country by the slavery of the Negroes be hearkened to as any argument in this question as to the justice of it. Oppression and iniquity are not palliated by the gain and advantage acquired to the authors of them. But the expediency of the institution, even for the subjects of Great Britain, is much doubted by those who are best acquainted with the state of the colonies. And some enlightened men of modern times have thought that sugar and tobacco might be cultivated without the slavery of Negroes. Of course, Wedderburn appealed this ruling in 1777, arguing that Knight owed him a perpetual service and might be taken to Jamaica by force. Knight's counsel argued that no man is by nature the property of another, and that, albeit under Jamaican law, slavery was recognised, that could not extend to Scotland. Wedderburn's counsel argued that commercial interests which underpinned Scotland's prosperity should prevail. The Court of Session, by eight votes to four, sustained the Sheriff's decision. The dominion assumed over this Negro under the laws of Jamaica, being unjust, could not be supported in this country to any extent, that therefore the defender had no right to the Negro service for any space of time, nor to send him out of the country against his consent, that the Negro was likewise protected under the Act 1701 from being sent out of the country against his consent, the Act 1701 being habeas corpus. Wedderburn devoted the rest of his days to upholding the rights of slaveholders, but he was successful in reclaiming his familial title to become the sixth baronet of blackness. In 1785, Lord Mansfield maintained his judgment on the case R versus the inhabitants of Thames Ditton that his ruling in the Somerset case only decided that a slave could not be forcibly removed from England against his will, and that it did not impact the legality or illegality of slavery. Dido Elizabeth Bell's social status with Lord Mansfield was never clear, and her exclusion from dining with guests was perhaps pragmatic rather than being indicative of her guardian's view of her. As Bell grew older, she took responsibility for managing the dairy and the poultry yards at Kenwood House, which were positions of status reserved for ladies of gentry. She also helped her uncle with his correspondence, which was less usual and would have normally been done by a male secretary or clerk. She was given an annual allowance of £30 and 10 shillings, which is around £5,500 today, which was several times the wages of a domestic worker. Lady Elizabeth Murray received around £100, but she was also a beneficiary in her own right through her mother's family, compared to Belle, who was illegitimate. Sir John Lindsay died in 1788 without any legitimate heirs, bequeathing £1,000 to his reputed children, which is unlikely to have included Bell. In his will of 1793, Lord Mansfield conferred Bell's freedom and bequeathed her the sum of £500 and an annuity of £100 per year, making her an heiress. I hope that you enjoyed this long and meandering history of slavery. I definitely learned a lot in producing it, and if you would like to see any more on this particular subject, please let me know in the comments below.